And as I, I, we jump into this, I, uh, I've been thinking about this message and what was going on in the, the passage. And as I sat in different small groups this week and we talked about it, I, I was just reminded as we were sitting there, one person commented, they said, do you realize what we're doing now is illegal in several different countries of the world? And did you realize what we are doing right now is illegal in several different countries in the world? Uh, coming together to worship, to ex- expound the name of Jesus Christ. It's really a phenomenal and controversial thing. I find that when God is working in, a pe- in an individual or a people or a, uh, a nation, not everyone is always as amazed and astounded and embracing it as we are. Uh, in fact, I, I have found that Christianity is the most persecuted religion on the face of the planet. Did you know that? Christianity is the most persecuted faith on the entire planet. And did you know the Bible is the most banned book in the entire world? What we're getting ready to do right now, like I said, is illegal in several different countries of the world. And did you know, by the way, and this is something that I was just looking up, I came across this, and in 2015 in America, you know what the top 10 most challenged books are? And this is Corinth, this happened... Um, but it happened during National Library Week of 2016. The Office for Intellectual Freedom published the 10 most challenged books in the United States of America. Did you know the Bible for the first time in history made the list in the United States of America? And did you know what the other books that were challenged? Fifty Shades of Grey, uh, looking for Alaska, I Am Jazz, Beyond Magenta, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night. There's a few others on there. But all of them had to do with something with transgendered or homosexuality and the Bible. Interesting that the Bible is now on a list of stuff with transgender, homosexuality, or sexual Im- immorality. And that's why these books are challenged. But the Bible now is being grouped in this. And it's fascinating because why do people have such animosity to the Bible? Why do people react so negatively that they have to challenge it in a school? Why is it banned in so many different countries? Why is what we are doing right now considered illegal in so many different nations of the earth? Because people don't want to see God at work. Because when God is at work in a person's life, it challenges everything else in a person, individual, people group, family, or a society. And today we're going to examine what happens when God begins working in a person and in a people and what that means in our lives. I mean, what does it mean when God starts working in your life? How do people respond? Many of us, if you've been in church for any period of time, you've had a moment where God begins to speak to you and you feel God's work and you're so excited about it, you want to share with other people, and you find out that others don't share your enthusiasm. And they react in different ways. In our families, with our spouses, with our children, grandchildren, or maybe with our parents or even grandparents, aunts, uncles, in our workplaces, with our bosses, our employees, or clients, classmates, and friends and neighbors. Not everyone embraces what God is doing in the life. But how do we respond to that? What does that mean? What is God trying to tell us through this passage that how we are to live in the middle of our societies when people see us as a threat to their own existence? That's what we're going to look at today. What, we're going to see what happens when God begins to work in our lives, how we can be prepared for that, how can we can respond to it, and what God wants to do in us and through us for the glory of his name. But before we go further, let's pray. Uh, that God would speak to us as we seek his face. Father, you are God. And we enter into your presence not by any righteousness that we have or we have none, but solely through the matchless name the precious blood and finished work of Jesus. It is by and in his name we come. 
And Lord, you have promised within your word that if we ask anything in the name of your son that you will answer. When it's according to your will as revealed within your word. And oh Lord our God, we pray that you answer now. That we as your people come hungry. Hungry for our daily bread, but thirsty also for the living water of your word to speak and fill us in the deep recesses of our souls. Lord, challenge us. Cut us, draw us near to yourself. Do what you need to do to make your word become alive in our hearts. And, O oh Lord our God, we know that this assembly, where your word is being spoken and your name is being praised, is considered worthy of death in different cultures. Lord, let us take advantage of the opportunity and the freedoms that we have here and now knowing that our brothers and sisters throughout the world do not have the same advantage. And, O oh Lord, our God, we know, according to your word, that angels are in this place, and they long to understand how we, who are walking dirt, could be recipients of so great a salvation. And we also know and understand that they are examining us now in this place trying to see how we are working out our salvation with fear and trembling, living under the authority that your word has called and placed us, whether it's in the church or in our daily lives. So Lord, please, we beg of you, speak to us today and let us not go forth without having met with you, the living God. We pray your blessing on us now. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's jump right in and uh, let's lay a little, review a little bit of the background of the things that have taken place uh, since the last time that we were together. You had the early churches kicked off. You had Peter and John were on their way to the temple that we saw last week to time of prayer in the early afternoon around, or in the middle of the afternoon, about three o'clock. And they encounter a man who had been born lame. He'd been lame his entire life. We learned from the text today that he was in his 40s. People had seen him day in and day out as they'd gone back and forth throughout the temple, and he had positioned himself to receive alms from them, from this religious, this group of religious devotees who would also be going for the time of prayer. And it was also known as the time of confession, uh, a time where uh, people would seek forgiveness for their sins, but they would also seek to give alms to the poor and somehow hoping to atone for their sins, which was one customary practice within Judaism. And so this man was receiving alms day in and day out. He's calling out for people to give alms to the poor, give alms to the poor. When Peter and John show up, and unlike everybody else, he says, look at us. And he looks at them expecting to be getting something from them. And then he says, Peter says, silver and gold we do not have, but what we do have in the name of Jesus Christ, we say to you, stand up and walk. And then we imagine last week what it would have been like for him to feel his ankles suddenly start to be made strong, to feel his feet tingling and feelings that he never ever had before, and then to be able to stand up on his feet and trying to maintain his balance when he's never stood in his entire life. It was like a baby trying to figure out how to walk and get this balance thing down. And then suddenly for him to be able to take a step step, and then the next step, and then we just pictured him, I mean, I pictured him running then back and forth throughout the temple, jumping up, praising God, doing all these amazing feats with his legs because he has the capacity to walk. And we also saw last week that his condition prevented him from entering into the temple complex because the scripture had forbidden anyone with any type of disability or deformity from entering into the God's collective presence. And we see then that he is able to walk back and forth through the temple, and his healing had garnered the attention of the authorities, and a crowd starts to develop because they'd seen him day in and day out. And he couldn't get them to look at him for anything, and suddenly they're all riveted on this man who has suddenly been healed, and he's clinging to James and John because he's afraid that the authorities are going to come and remove him because he'd been forbidden for so long, he didn't know how to enter into the freedom to know now that he was qualified to be able to be within this temple complex. And Peter, sensing his opportunity, seeing all of the people in the crowd gathered, takes a moment, like any good preacher, to preach. He comes ready to bring the word. And he, he brings this amazing sermon. 
And he cuts right to the heart. And it says that 2,000 more people believed in making a cumulative total of 5,000 men, which we're going to look at in a moment. But we see that not everybody was praising God. Yes, there were people praising God. Their lives were being transformed. But not everyone likes it when God does a work in a life. And that's where we pick up today in Acts chapter 4 is the response where the empire strikes back, if you will, to what is going on in the people of God. So we look in verse 1, And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Now the priests were those that were serving in the temple. You had the captain of the temple whose job was to make sure that certain groups did not go from one part of the temple to another. You had what was known as the court of the Gentiles, those who were born outside of the covenant community of God, were only allowed certain layer of access. And then from that, Jewish women were allowed to be closer. And then Jewish men would be closer than that and then the court of priests we would get the closest to them and so the captain of the guard was to make sure that everything stayed in order and people didn't cross the boundaries that they were not allowed to cross and there were warning signs distributed and posted throughout the temple warning people of death ahead if they were to violate any of those boundary lines and so now wondering if a boundary line had been crossed you have the temple uh, captain of the guard the priests are making its way to to make sure everything's okay. And then you have the Sadducees, which were part of the Jewish ruling council known as the Sanhedrin or Sanhedrin. And they were the majority group that came together to rule and make judgments of Israel. And we know that it's part of the Sanhedrin that Jesus went before in his trial when they convicted him of blasphemy and they sentenced him to death passing that in on to Pilate. So we see then that these Sadducees came and they didn't like Jesus because Jesus was a threat to their way of living. And the same with the priests and everyone else. That's what we see happen is when God comes into a life, it becomes a threat to our way of living. It changes us. Jesus means change. And we don't do well with change. If you don't believe me, let me ask you a question. Do you sit in a different spot than you did last week? You sit in the, mainly, and some of you are a little bit different than this, but most of us sit in the same section or at least the same area that we do the week before. We don't like change very much. But this changed, what Jesus meant was greater than just change. It threatens the way that we live. It threatens everything about who we are. And really where it hits home for most of us, Excuse me, it's a threat to our status, a reputation, but many of us are okay with that. Some of us are, but then it becomes a threat to our money, and then things get real. To give you an idea, in, the, in Ephesus, okay, a city in uh, uh, what is now Turkey, when the people of Ephesus came to embrace Jesus, the authorities there had a negative reaction, which we're going to see later on in the book. But because Jesus threatens their money. See, Ephesus was the headquarters of Artemis worship. Matter of fact, they had one of the most grandiose temples dedicated to the worship of Artemis. That's what it is in Greek. In Rome, Rome or, or the Roman theology or the mythology, it is known as Diana. And pilgrims would come from all over the world to worship at her temple, which was known as one of the seven wonders of the world. And the Ephesians saw themselves as guardians of this temple. And they made money off of the religious tourists that were coming in. I don't know if you've been in a tourist area, but certain cultures rely on tourism. Niagara Falls relies on tourism. We know that they're not going to make money unless people are coming in and getting different stuff. And here, the Ephesians, they were making money off of these religious tourists that would come and they would eat and purchase different things. And this group rose up to create idols or these statues that they could take home with them and hand off to the kids. They want to take home souvenirs after their, their religious experience. And for the really devoted and the wealthy, they created silver altars for them to transport at home and bow down to where they could worship there at home. So when the gospel was being shared to the people at Ephesus, people then embraced Christ and turned from their 
idols, which caused these guys who were part of the guild of silversmiths, were going looking around going, hey, I'm losing money here. I don't like this Jesus guy. I don't know much about him, but I'm having a hard time putting food on my table. And so they react negatively to try to shut him down. Now see, when the gospel comes into a life, it really threatens everything about who we are how we spend our money, what we watch on television, where we go, what we do. Maybe it's our occupation. Maybe it's who we interact with. Maybe it's what we're studying. It could be anything, but it threatens the way we live because it challenges what we believe. It challenges what we believe. Now remember, the Sadducees, this group part of the Jewish ruling council, they had certain characteristics of their theology. It's a religious group. Now, they denied the first five books, actually only believed in the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. After that, they didn't believe that the rest of what we would call the Old Testament was divinely inspired of God. And they denied the supernatural. They denied spirits, angels, demons. They denied also the resurrection from the dead. So you could see why Jesus would be a massive threat to the Sadducees. If they based their entire theology and reputation and status in the community and held this theological belief, a resurrected Jesus would kind of fly in the face to show that their theology was bupkis. And so therefore, it, because it challenges. That's what the gospel does. When God comes into our life, he challenges what we know and what we believe. He challenges what we believe about everything that we hold dear. He might challenge how you believe in salvation. He might challenge how you, you believe in what you understand about your marriage or your children or about races or backgrounds or the economics or the poor. It challenges the core of who we are. It challenges what we believe. That's what God does when he comes into a life. He challenges what we believe. It causes us to choose what is right and what is wrong. It ch causes us, uh, I mean, to, to, to evaluate so many different things. And there is no way that we can be neutral in regards to the gospel. It makes us question what we have been taught by our family when we were growing up. Or perhaps our religious devotion and whether or not it is right or wrong. I feel for those who are raised in different faiths because the gospel does challenge our belief system and it may challenge the community around us. Missionary Dwayne Elmer talks about sharing Jesus um, with some, he doesn't give the country, he simply says they were Asian adults, so from some region uh, within greater Asia, it could be several different countries. And he, he, he says that every one of his interactions with them they said that before they could follow Jesus, they had to ask a parent, an uncle, an aunt, or all three. Now, for those of us who were born in the West, this is, doesn't make a lot of sense because we are extremely individualistic. But for them to make a monumental decision such as what one believes and how one follows or who one follows, one worships, you need advice of those who are greater or older or more esteemed or wiser than you. So one Asian man, actually, he said he couldn't follow Christ because if he, he would be honor, dishonoring his ancestors because he would be doing something that no one else has done and would bring shame upon them because for them, ancestors are living things. This is what we need to understand, by the way, for other cultures around us, especially if those that come from Asian backgrounds. There's a reason why that the gospel has not found a great root in a country such as Japan, by the way, one of the most unreached countries on the face of the earth, and one that we don't think about very often when we talk about the gospel, because they're very affluent and have a lot of technology and things like that, but they're one of the most unreached countries on the face of the earth. Why? They've had the gospel shared with them, but because we have failed to understand the mindset that they have come from, and they believe that if they come to faith in Christ, they will actually bring shame upon all of their ancestors whom they see as living. One man actually was told that he would go into the presence of God because he believed. And the man asked, well, what about those who do not believe? He goes, they're in hell. And he goes, then I cannot go into heaven because I would go to a place that my ancestors themselves could not go and I would bring shame to them. 
We have some, even within our fellowship, that we have interacted with over time, and they said they cannot believe because a grandparent or parent has forbid them from believing. Now, to those of us who are in individual cultures, individualistic, this sounds crazy, but we understand that this is a part of the culture, and the Bible actually supports a great deal of this. So how do we confront this? How do we deal with this? To understand what's at stake. As I was sharing the gospel with one man who came from a completely different cultural background, he said, I would give up the entirety of my legacy. Everything I knew, I would be shamed by my family. I would be ostracized, kicked out. He understood the full weight of what the gospel meant to him. And as I was thinking of this, I, I came across another passage where I believe that God was really showing how he wants to speak to us and even talk about how our ancestors and what they would say if they were to be here today. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells a story of two men, a rich man and Lazarus. Not the Lazarus that Jesus was friends with, just a man named Lazarus. And they, this man, this rich man had everything he wanted in life, but he didn't believe in God. Lazarus had nothing, was in poverty, but he believed in God. And they both died, and they went, to, they went to two places, but it was on the same kind of playing field. And this is before Christ, death and resurrection, where heaven was fully guaranteed. Where did people go when they died before Christ? Well, we see that there's a place called Abraham's bosom. It's paradise. This is where the, the righteous dead would go before the death of Christ. And then it was separated by a great chasm. And on the other side was known as Hades, uh, also known as Sheol, the abode of the dead, where those unrighteous would go and they would be in eternal torment. And Jesus tells this story, and he says that the rich man calls out to Father Abraham on the other side of this great chasm. And he says, Father Abraham, tell Lazarus to dip his finger in the water and come over here and cool my tongue because I am tormented in this place. It's so hot. It's so bad. It's, it, he's a complete torture. Then Abraham says, there is a chasm that is fixed that cannot be crossed. And he says, well then, how about you send Lazarus back or send someone back to tell my ancestors, my brothers, my sisters not to come to this awful place. And he says, no. They have the law and the prophets. That is sufficient. And see, what the point of that story is, is that God's word is sufficient, but there's a greater principle that we can see that's at work there, is that even with our ancestors, if our ancestors who did not believe could testify today and tell us what to believe, they would say, do not come here. Believe in Jesus. Follow him. Because he is the one through whom there is eternal life. It challenges what we believe. It challenges our traditions, our customs, the things that grandma taught us or grandpa taught us. It challenges everything about what we hold to be valuable. For many of us, for some of us, it's not been that big of a challenge, our life, because we were taught about this since we were young. But there's others of us that come from backgrounds where we were taught something very, very different. And the cost is so much greater. But we understand when the gospel does come into a person, to an individual, to a people group, or to a culture, or even a nation, it challenges what we believe and what we hold dear. And we have to understand that truth. It challenges what we believe. But God doesn't, God's work doesn't just challenge what we believe. It confronts us in our sin. It confronts us in our sin. Check out verse 5 for a minute of Acts chapter 4. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, who was considered to be the high priest, by the way. The Romans actually removed Annas from, uh, they put a end date for his rule, but he was still considered to be the high priest. His son, son-in-law, Caiaphas, it becomes the high priest and then after Caiaphas, actually, then it becomes John. We don't know exactly who Alexander is, but he's part of this high priestly family. So th these are the religious leaders that are there. The very people that were on the committee or team or council that called Jesus for Jesus' death. And all of the high priestly family, verse 7, and when they had set them in their midst, they inquired. So they had arrested Peter and John. They brought him before them. And you think these guys would be shaking in their boots. Remember, Peter denied Jesus in front of a servant girl. 
He was so afraid of what the authorities would do. They were hiding out away from them before Jesus rose from the dead, so afraid. And now he's in front of the very people that he feared. Think about that. These people control whether you live or die. That's not an easy thing to swallow. That's powerful. We know later on that Peter will die for his faith. Tradition, church tradition has that Peter was actually crucified upside down after he watched his wife crucified in front of him. So they are brought before this council. And they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Peter calls them to account. He confronts them in their sin. He doesn't care about their status, where they studied, who they studied under, what position they held. He didn't care about any of it. And that's what God doesn't care about what status you have, how much money you give, what position you serve at. God confronts us all in the middle of our sin. He won't let us stand right where we are. We have to do business with the sin in front of us. And he indicts them. He says, you crucified him. You are responsible. Wow. No one can remain neutral with Jesus or the Bible. Because the Bible indicts us all as sinners. We are confronted in our sin. No matter what it is, we all have sinful tendencies that we're born with that we try to rationalize alcoholism, drug addiction, gluttony, lying, gossip, sexual immorality, homosexuality, witchcraft, lust, theft, coarse jesting, and the list goes on and on. It all seems natural to us, and if we are honest, we love our sin. We all have sin that we want to hold on to, but it's this sin, this sin that condemns us. We are responsible for spiritually participating in Jesus' death. And the gospel confronts every single person with their sin. And that he became our sin on the cross. It is our debt that he paid. God's work is also a threat because it changes those around us. It changes those around us. Look back at verse 4 for a moment. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Now we saw before, this isn't an additional 5,000 to the 3,000 that believed earlier. This is 5,000 men total that have now believed. Now that means a lot of friends and neighbors, they changed. And not, by the way, that's just 5,000 men. Women weren't counted in a part of this, but if we were to put men and women together here, that's about a church of 10,000 people. Think about that. Think about now how your friends and neighbors are different. Think about the traditions you had, the things that you wanted to go to, the things you wanted to be a part of. And they said, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not going to be a part of that. When someone's life changes, we might admire from afar and congratulate them. But when we find out that the pattern uh, or the sins and habits that they once did, they're no longer doing, we feel indicted and guilty because we know that we are still participating in them. And we know in our heart by their life that what we're doing is wrong. We don't like feeling wrong. We don't like feeling bad about anything. We want everyone to make us feel good. We will rationalize to do anything to make us feel like we are good people. Even those who have been, execu- or have been uh, sentenced to die on death row for heinous murders all believe, almost every single one of them, after they were interviewed, believe that they were really good people at heart. They were good people. We think we're good people. But when we see a life that is changed, we don't like that because it's a threat to our way of living. We see that they're not watching the same movies, the same TV shows. They're not going to the same websites. They're not saying the same racist things that they were saying before. They're They're not loving people. They're changed in how they interact with their spouse. They change in how they spend their money. They're not going to the bars late at night, spending all their paycheck. They're doing all of these things that are different, and it changes those around us. And not everyone receives that or wants that change to occur. Now, before we go on to this next section, we need to go back 
and look at Luke's words in his first volume. Remember, Acts is the second volume of a two-volume series that he wrote. Luke was the first book. Acts was the second. Luke was a documentation of everything that Jesus said and did, and Acts is picking up right after Jesus had left, and it's what the Holy Spirit was doing, or what he was doing in the early church. Now, Luke, who had written, uh, again, Acts, he is giving a foreshadow in the book of Luke. He says this, Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places, famines and pestilences. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all, all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. And you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it, therefore, In your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. Again, this understanding of the ancestors, friends around, shame in the greater community, that's a hard thing to swallow. But it's what God calls us to. And some of you they will even put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Now remember, it was the Spirit's coming that ushered in the beginning of the end of time. Now that we know Luke's words from his first volume, let let us look at what happens in verse 8 through 12. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone." And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We can see here that we are called to testify for his name that God will equip us to testify on his behalf. That's what we can see from this. Is that when, when God calls us to be in front of such people, he will call us and equip us to testify for the glory of his name. To testify what God has done in our lives. We all have a personal testimony Whether you're saved as a child or as an adult, it is God's story written on your hearts. It's how the evil one is defeated, by the way, as we read in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, where we read in the early, uh, this is what we read in Revelation 12, 11. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb. And according to what Jesus has done, what he did on the cross, his blood being poured out, he conquered the devil. But it says, and by the word of their testimony what God has done in their life you cannot deny a changed life and we are to testify and Peter is testifying how his life was changed and how this man's life was changed for they love not their lives even unto death that we are called to testify now what do we testify about we testify about God's power at work God's power at work in our lives And in the lives of other people. They testified about a lame man and be made well. It was a crippled man who was made well. And it was by the name of Jesus that he was made well. Let me ask you this. How has God's power been at work in your life? How is God's power at work in your life? How is God's power at work in your life? Where is it? If not... Why not? When Jesus saves a person, he saves them to the uttermost. He transforms them and makes them into a new creation. He makes them whole. Why do you not feel whole? Perhaps it is because you have not experienced God's power yet, and you are not truly saved. Has God freed you? Has he forgiven you? What has God done for you And why don't you tell other people about it? What are you afraid of? Peter testified about God's power at work, but he also testified about our personal responsibility. 
As we saw before, God's work confronts us in our sin, but God's work requires a response. Remember, each of us is spiritually responsible for Jesus' death. It was our sin that he became on the cross, and it was the price for each and every one of our sins. It also means that Jesus' death was sufficient to pay the price for our sins, and if we do not acknowledge Jesus' death for our sins, then we have to pay the price for every one of them, a price that we cannot pay. Each one of us is responsible for the sins that we have done. Not one will be missed. Every thought, sinful attitude, careless action, blasphemy, swear word, every racist thought, failure to love, all is remembered to God. Will God give us a pass? No. Will we, will we be able to blame others? Something that I see most Americans do very well. We don't like taking personal responsibility, and it's easier for us to say, it's because of them is why I'm here, and we play the victim. I'm not saying that there aren't things we have to suffer for, but we all have a personal responsibility for our own sin. We can't help what is being done to us, but we can only be responsible for what we ourselves have done. Will we be able to claim that others did it to us or that we couldn't help the struggles we were to have? The sacrifice of Christ was too great to allow us to continue on in our sin. Sin must be judged, and Jesus' death has shown that. Each of us must take responsibility for our own sin and what we are to do with them. A different way of putting it is as Jesus said to Peter, who do you say I am? When you look at Jesus, not just verbally, but what does your life say of who Jesus is? That will determine what you do with your sin. If you take responsibility, confess them, and believe Jesus died for your sins, he will forgive you. But if you reject him, then there no longer remains a sacrifice sufficient to pay for your sins. Peter quotes scripture that was in Psalm 118.22 and Psalm 28.16 next. He says that Jesus is the chief cornerstone who has been rejected but the one through whom, upon whom God would build his church. And then he says this, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He testifies about the only savior God has provided for us all. The only savior that God has provided for us all. Jesus is the only one through whom we can have salvation. There is no adding to him, no addendums, nothing to take away. It is not through a generic, generic, morally therapeutic, American patriotic God. Not in any other God, but through Jesus and him alone. He is the only savior of the world, and God has declared this through raising him from the dead. See, it is not enough for a person to believe that there is a God. That's not enough. You have to believe that Jesus Christ is God. In America, we do have this God, this patriotic American God who never calls us to sacrifice, who's always benevolent to us, who never judges sin, who's always looking out for us, and who's always ready to fight on all comers who loves equality, who loves to help people, but he is not the God of the New Testament. See, Jesus Christ is the one through whom God has ordained salvation to be, and there is no other name, none. There's nothing to add to, nothing to take away from. There are some that say, because the church failed in its mission, God brought another prophet to make that right wrong. No! Oh! It was once and for all, no matter how deficient man was, that does not negate of what Christ did in his son. He's the only one, and he's provided salvation for every people group, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. He's able to transform every heart and our mind, no matter how much they held on to their sin, that he can transform the worst of us. That's what, the God, what, God's do, what God does in a life. And that's what we can see here. We can see, we testify at God's power at work and our personal responsibility, but we have to testify to others, our friends, our family, our classmates, our coworkers, 
that God has provided a savior for us all, and that and his name is Jesus. Now God's work is seen in how he transforms us too, by the way. We talk about how we testify about what God has done, but our life then becomes a visible sermon. It's been said that your life is the only Bible that some people will ever read. Now let me ask you this. What do people, what could they learn about God from looking at your life? Be honest now. Like I said before, we all try to make ourselves a lot better than we want to be. But in the the deepest, dirtiest part of your life that you want to keep away from prying eyes, what does that say that no one else would know? Maybe you are, you're very honest with God. What would that say? See, these men were transformed. These men that were standing before them had been transformed, and their lives bore witness to the truth of who Jesus is. Does your life bear witness to the truth of who Jesus is? Remember, they were once hiding in an upper room from the Jewish ruling council, and now they were bold enough. They had some Holy Spirit chutzpah. They're standing in front of them, confronting them with the fact that they had killed Jesus. And I love, by the way, how Luke describes them. I love this. After all, Luke was a physician, by the way. He had education. He had status. But he makes a special effort to show that they were uneducated and common men. Look at verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and they perceived that they were uneducated, they didn't have a degree, they were common guys working for a living, they were astonished. Where did these guys get this boldness? And they recognized, I love this. They had been with Jesus. Let me ask you this. Are you bold? Can people see that you've been with Jesus? For God, it's not about the status we possess. He has chosen to work with the foolish to shame the wise. He has chosen those without status in society, those without special abilities. He has chosen the weak to shame the strong. It's not about the schools you go to or the head knowledge that you have. It matters if your heart has been surrendered to God. It's not in gaining more in the sight of the world that we find peace, but it's in giving up. Peter and John were surrendered to Jesus, and God then gave them a spirit, and it is his spirit that will help us with strength. God gives us strength. And we have to let our lives show that. You know, in the book of Proverbs, it says, the righteous are as bold as lions, but the wicked run away, though no one is chasing. Are you as bold as a lion? We can't serve without the strength that God supplies. If we can do God's ministry in our own strength, then it's not God's ministry. We need God's strength to be able to stand up and testify to God's greatness. Do we have his strength? Do you? Do you have a holy boldness? Do you need it? How have you testified to others? Are you afraid? Have you shared your faith with your family, with your friends, with your coworkers, with your neighbors, with your classmates? Some would say, it's against policy to do that. And that's where we have to remember the words of the disciples. We have to obey God rather than men. Let's look at this verse 14 through 18. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called him and charged them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. See, when, when, we, when God is working, when God transforms lives, when God is at work in our lives, many will try to silence us. Many will try to silence us. They don't want to hear it. When we continue on, the world and the devil will partner together to stop and silence our testimony, whether it's through legislation or simply intimidation. 
The devil wants to silence us. He keeps unbelievers under a, under a veil of unbelief, blind to God's work. And if the devil can silence us, then others will not be transformed. And I will tell you this, that the devil has done a good job at keeping us silent. He is intimidated. He has made us look like fools or crazy. He's had us mocked. He's made people laugh at us. He's made us feel that if people call us out, that we can't stand, that it somehow affects our self-esteem. He has distorted the message or caused certain parts of it to be emphasized, thus making people focus on certain parts at the exclusion of others that leads to misunderstanding and abuse so that people might turn away and disbelieve. For others of us, the devil gives pleasure and comfort bountifully so that we might forget who God is or don't want to think about him so that he might possibly just go away. Or the devil makes us believe the illusion that we can do or have it all so we busy ourselves with good things but won't have time to do the best things. Now some of us, we don't have to worry about being silent because we don't say anything anyway. We don't have to worry about opposition or intimidation because we are already silent. Satan's already done his job in our lives. What is keeping us from testifying about what God has done for us? Laws? Persecution? We don't have persecution here, not like others have. Let me say this. Testify about Christ while it's good. Because if we fail to testify when it's good and easy, and in our society, though we have a lot of issues, we have nothing like the threat of death over, just hanging over our heads. Then if you can't testify when things are good, how are you going to testify when things get hard? Things will become hard if we fail in, to testify. And what kind of faith do we have if we can't testify when things are good? I know some believe that they will be able to testify about God when things get hard, but if you can't do it when it's easy, how do you expect to do it when it gets hard? And life or death is at stake. Look at verse 19 through 22 as we conclude our message today. But Peter and John answered them. These guys threatened them. They tried to intimidate them. They tried to legislate them. I mean, they had, and they, they, they weren't empty words either, by the way. They'd already killed their master. And they respond, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. Now, it's interesting. Notice that. They had no way to punish them because of the people. Now they're afraid. They're afraid. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. What he's saying there is he's saying that they're afraid because they know God's kingdom cannot be stopped. See, that's where our hope is. That's what we have to understand. No matter how bad it gets, God wins. It's ended. It's done. He's declared that he's victory. God's kingdom can't be stopped. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Rattle those gates. Rattle the gates of those cultures. Pray that God would break them down. Pray that God would bring those governments down. I pray that God would shake the gates of North Korea, that the gospel would go forth into that country or into India where you have a prime minister who is trying to legislate and persecute the church there. That God would rattle his gate. That God would pull forth and band that church together to be so strong to testify. But so many people are afraid, afraid of losing their lives, afraid of being killed. But we need to pray for them and we need to, let our own lives be a demonstration of the power of God within us that his kingdom cannot be stopped no matter what our government does no matter what is being said no matter what is being legislated we might lose a cultural Christianity but we're going to gain a real living breathing Christ that will transform hearts and minds that will remove racism that will call us to be reconcilers that will call us to be those that are reaching out and going to the deep darkest and lowest and lost places that are being patient that are not crying for their rights but are laying down their lives so that other people might be one to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ it cannot be stopped that should excite you it excites me to know that no matter what country might try to stop the glorious gospel of Jesus, whether it's Kim Jong-un or Modi, 
leaders of their own countries, that God's gospel can't be stopped. Or they're in our own country, our own leaders, our own legislators. Because when the power of God gets a hold of you, you can't contain it. I love what Peter and John said, we can't help but testify to what we've seen and heard. Can you help but testify? Can you like Jeremiah, Jeremiah who said, his word is like a fire and I cannot hold it in. Or Paul saying, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. I can't help but speak. It overflows from me. It changed who I am and I want it to flow out to other people. Can you say that of the gospel of God? Why not? Has God not got a hold of you? Do you not yet believe? Have you not placed your faith and trust in Jesus and what he has done? Are you not actively following him in obedience? Are you not taking up your cross and dying daily so that the resurrection life of Christ might be evidenced in seen within you. Take up the sword of his spirit. Read the word of God. Let his spirit transform you from the inside out that we might go forth to rattle the cages of this fallen, failing kingdom of the devil. The glory of God might go forth and lives might be changed and transformed for the honor, praise, and glory of his awesome name. And I know here today that there are some people that not yet have not yet placed their faith and trust in Christ. And I invite you to be a part of this kingdom that cannot be stopped. A kingdom that is based in a living hope because the Savior has been resurrected. And the scripture is clear that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Call on the name of the Lord. Repent of your sins. Embrace what Jesus has done for you. Invite him to be the Savior and Lord of your life and he will save you. And for those of us who need to take that next step of obedience, what is that next step that God is calling you to? To be a further and to live a life worthy of the kingdom that you've been called to be a part of. Do you need to be baptized? Do you need to join together with God's people? Do you need to, to give generously to him? Do you need to sacrifice yourself to serve the poor, the lowest, and the lost? Is he calling you to give up everything in your home and your life to go to a people in a group that has not yet heard the message of Jesus? Or is he calling you to go to school so you could learn how to translate the scriptures and reach out to those who have not yet heard or had the word of God in their language. What is he calling you to do? Who is he calling you to be? Surrender and follow because when God is working, it cannot be stopped. Let's partner together with that for the glory, honor, and praise of his awesome name. Let's close this word of, with a word of prayer. Oh, Lord, our God, you are the great God. You are the almighty God. And, oh, Lord, our God, we pray that you invade us, that you be in this place right now, that you convict hearts and minds, that you draw people to yourself, that you take a hold of men and women, no matter what their age is, no matter what their background is, no matter what sin that they have done. Lord, I pray you take hold of them and that you transform them and you let their life be a living sacrifice for you, that your power is shown and displayed through their everyday lives, in their homes as they're trying to raise their children to the truth and message of Jesus, as they try to love their spouses, as they try to do their work. Lord, let your gospel be transformational over every single part and parcel of our life, that your kingdom might go forth and it cannot be stopped. Oh, Lord, our God, transform us. Do a work in here that only you can do. And, Lord, we know that you are working. And yet, Lord, we humble ourselves before you, knowing you were the Lord of the church. Lord, continually grow us. Grow us spiritually that we might take that next step of obedience with you. Grow us numerically and diversify us. Lord, let our leadership be reflective of our greater community. Let our church be reflective. Let every tribe and tongue that's in our community come together to resound and praise to your awesome name. Lord, let our lives be an example of how you have brought us into one body, that we can talk together and listen to one another and forgive one another and truly live as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And oh Lord, our God, may that spirit's power be evidenced within us and may it be a fire that we cannot keep it within ourselves. May you allow us to speak that. Give us opportunities in our schools. Give us opportunities in our workplaces. Give us opportunities in our neighborhood to be bold for the glory of your name. And when people see the boldness that was within each one of us, may they note that we were common, ordinary people, but that we have been with Jesus, and Jesus is in us. Oh, Lord, our God, do your work within us. Empower us, direct us, for the honor and praise of your awesome name. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen.